Good morning, Mount Zion Church. Let's stand to our feet.
worship you. You freed the captives. You freed the captives and you're freeing hearts right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the lepers. I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. on us Holy Spirit come Holy Spirit won't you come now Holy Spirit our hearts are open we need you now fill us up with yourself more and more of you come Holy Spirit
The Apostle Paul is very clear with us, and our pastor has shared this scripture a couple of times in the last month. It simply says the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy. Let's just stop on that one for a minute. How are you doing with your joy meter this morning? There is a lot to be joyful for. We are in the midst of a time as a world where there's a lot of anxieties and concerns and wars and rumors of wars, but scripture is clear in the midst of it to find our joy in him. The joy of the Lord is our strength and it's good for our souls to start worship kind of like this and take off with the plane. So we're going to sing about joy in this place. And I will just comment that the Lord is clear. The joy of the Lord is our strength. He gives us the fruit of the spirit of joy. But there is one passage in the New Testament where it says that when the disciples returned from going out and ministering, it says, and Jesus rejoiced in our English text. In the original language, it says he leaped and twirled about. So picture that, our Lord getting so thrilled with joy that others were doing his work, that there was truly joy in his house. So let there be joy in ours today because his work goes on. His kingdom cannot be stopped. His work cannot be thwarted. Amen. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. And then it says this, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And I don't think it's a calm, morbid step today. God is perfectly joyful being God today. So let us keep in step with our joyful God. Amen? Amen. the God who evermore will be. 
He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. As he hung upon that cross, and then he rose up from the grave. My God still rolling stones away. Yeah, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Now we're royalty, we are prisoners, and now we're running free. We were forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, we, we were, were the, the beggars. beggars, and now we're royalty. to worship you, to give thanks, to rejoice in your goodness, to rejoice in your love, to rejoice in your steadfast love, Lord God, that has never failed us. We are here, Lord God, giving thanks that you are a holy God. There is no darkness in you. We're coming here rejoicing, Lord God, that you came, you sought us out, you've knocked at the door of our hearts, you've called our names. Lord God, we give thanks, Lord Jesus, that you went to that cross. Lord God, when we had no regard for you, you went to that cross for us. And we are so grateful we can't begin to express the gratitude of our hearts. We are here, Lord God, indeed rejoicing, rejoicing in you, rejoicing that your kingdom will not fall. Your kingdom is sure and certain. Lord God, your promises are true. You are faithful to your word, Lord God. And so in all the chaos of this world, we are here rejoicing this day. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We lift our hearts before you. And we pray, Father, all these things in the name of our Lord, our Savior, the King of kings, your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Yeah, let's give thanks. Amen.
Now, let's pray together as he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, we have this beautiful table set for us here today. We gathered here on Friday night to pray, as the scripture tells us on our beautiful banner here, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And the scripture is very plain. Look it up, Psalm 122. And so we were here praying uh, for peace and uh, for the peace of Jerusalem. You know, those of us uh, who were not part of, we're not descendants of in the flesh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in Jesus, we have been grafted onto the tree of Israel. Read it. Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. Read it. Grafted onto the tree of Israel. You know, when the apostle Paul, one of those first followers of Jesus, went out, you know, going to that, he, he hated everyone else except his own fellow Israelites until Jesus got his heart. He hated them all because they treated Israel so bad. And then, then he went out and God changed, Jesus changed his name. His name was Saul, Hebrew name. Now it's going to be Paul, a Roman name. I'm giving you a new name. You're going to have the name of all those people that I'm sending you out to love. And predictably, not all people received him. Many people, you know, he got beat up again and again, all of that. Do you know one time he was walking through a marketplace and there was a sorcerer. Do you know what the word sorcery is in Greek of the New Testament? Pharmakia. Hmm. What does that make sorcerers? Drug dealers. There was a drug dealer who had a slave girl. Had her, I'm sure, high as a kite all the time. And she was telling fortunes, as we might say. And he's making money. And Paul's walking through the marketplace. He and some others traveling with him. And then one day, this slave girl says, listen to these men. They are men of God. And Paul turned and prayed for her. And it all lifted right off of her. But the dealer, her owner, saw what had happened. And what did he start saying? These Jews, these Jews, these Jews. And the crowd grabbed him and dragged him in front of the magistrates. And they were beaten horribly. Paul never gave up. But then we read again and again that some of his fellow Israelites came against him. Came against him. Came against him. Why were they coming against him? Well, he was talking about Jesus. But What was the deep reason they came against him? Because they were scared to death. They were living in the Roman Empire. They had learned how to keep a very low profile, not all times and all places, but persecution would just break out. And they were keeping a very low profile. And they would say to people like, Paul, would you shut your mouth? You're going to get us all killed. As the word of Jesus spread to person after person after person, And you know, people were very, very poor. Most people, especially as time went on and history went into what we often call the dark ages, very few people could actually read. They'd hear stories about Paul's fellow Israelites telling him to shut up. And hatred and anger developed. They weren't reading Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. Read it. And you know, there's some places... Oh, there's some churches right around here that say we have replaced Israel. That is not what the Word of God says. We've been grafted on. We are a branch grafted on to the tree of Israel. Wow. So we do, we will pray this morning for the peace of Jerusalem. We're going to remember Jesus as he gathered with his disciples, gathered with his disciples that night before he went to the cross. There was an out-and-out war going on. Oh, but there was so much tension, and there were rumors of war. It wouldn't be very long after Jesus uh, ascended back to the Father that a revolution would break out. Guess what the first revolution broke out against? The preachers. 
but actually the establishment, the temple establishment, the high priest would be equivalent to a billionaire today. And it broke out. Tens of thousands of the priests in the temple were slaughtered in a revolution against them. They pretty much had sold out to Rome. And then when revolution broke out in Israel against Rome itself, massive destruction. Rome, they were, of course, no match for the military power of Rome. Jesus had warned them. You remember he cried looking over the city of Jerusalem, would that you knew the things that make for peace. Wow. So there were rumors of war. One of Jesus' own disciples, Simon the Zealot, had come out of the Zealots, which was a revolutionary party, as Jesus got hold of his heart. So Jesus took the bread that night. He broke it. He gave it to them. He said, take, eat this. This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat this. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to be the one broken for you. He was telling them. I will be broken. I will give my life for you. Take and eat this. Remember what I've done. You're going to need to hold on to me, he was telling them. You need to go to trust in me. Find your strength and your courage in me. And then he took the cup and he lifted it up. And he said, this is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this and be glad. We need the mercy of God. Jesus gave his life. His blood was shed. He gave his life for you and me. If you have faith in Jesus as a way of feeding on his love, drinking deep the mercy of God. Take that little communion pack there, that tiny little piece of bread, drink from that tiny little cup. If you don't have faith in Jesus, you could put your faith in him right now. He's here in this place. This table does not look anything like the table would have looked like. They would have been in a poor room with a row, real simple low table. But there's a heavenly banquet waiting as we put our faith in Jesus. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful. You went to that cross. You didn't run from it. You went there. And you knew that you would take our sin and our grief and our sorrow upon yourself. And you would break the power of it. You would pay the price of it. You would descend into hell for all of us that by your wounds, by your sacrifice, by the price you paid, we would be forgiven. We would be freed we would be healed, we would be saved. And we thank you, Lord God, and we love you, and we just lift up our hearts to you now, praising your name, rejoicing in you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Yeah, let's amen, give thanks amen. one more time. Amen. amen, amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, we have two opportunities here at Mount Zion Church where we minister to those in prison and one of those opportunities happens here locally at the Hartford County Detention Center. Larry Bowman is the one who leads um, that group. There's some people, they go there weekly and lead a Bible study. And then we also have an opportunity, that, opportunity that's outside of Hartford County. And I'm going to ask Dan to come up and share about this opportunity. Yay. Thank you, All right. Thank you very much. Uh, there may be a placemat near you. And uh, that's a message. So it is a message of love. You may pick up, if you feel so inclined, the placemat that is near you or on one of the tables or at the table in the back uh, as you exit. During the month of November, the Jessup Correctional Institute, which is the maximum security prison in Jessup, um, which is down by the airport, uh, there's about 1,000 people in that prison, um, maximum security prison for a bunch of different reasons. And uh, the Kairos organization allows a four, or is allowed to do a four-day weekend retreat. Some people have been on Walk to Emmaus or a seven-mile walk or that type of thing, Caristo. Uh, you can draw a message of love. You can transform this blank placemat into a message of love, which will be given to the prisoners 
a certain prisoner will get your message. It could be, it could be a photograph, it could be a picture, it has to be drawn. A picture, it could be uh, words from a scripture, it could be a poem. Uh, the rules are, it has to be done with one media, like all crayons or all markers or all watercolor, and it's a gift of art. You've heard about being poured out like a gift offering. This is your chance. The window of opportunity uh, is very short. You have two weeks to fill out a placemat, message of love, message of hope, positive. Uh, and that's the message on the placemats. You may have a placemat near you or the placemats in the back. Feel free to take one if you feel so inclined. And then I want to emphasize uh, the point about the Hartford County Detention Center. If you want to take that big step to go to the Hartford County Detention Center uh, with the small group that does that, uh, there is some training that takes place during the last two weeks of October and the first two weeks of November. You can get in on that. I have the info, and I can give you Larry's information. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Thanks. Dan. Amen. All right. So th that's pretty amazing that there's a team that goes into the prison, and I know Dan would love to share some stories with you in the lobby afterwards. It's just going to touch your heart. It's an awesome, awesome ministry. Um, so, hey, if you are here for the first time, just want to give you a warm welcome. If this is your very first time at Mount Zion Church, we're so glad that you are here. There's so much going on in that bulletin that you re received when you came in. Uh, lots of ways to plug in, uh, to become part of this family here. Um, check that out. Pray for that. Maybe it's with the prison ministry, and there's so many other ministries as well. And then also, if it is your first time, if you would be so bold to write your name and contact information, there's a tear-off portion there. And then we have three offering containers here. Just put it in the offering container, and we'd love to reach out to you to say hello. There's also a place to write down prayer requests as well. So we have a team that prays specifically every uh, Wednesday morning for those prayer requests. So check that out. Yeah. Hey, I, I did want to say, you know, I've learned through the years to take the Bible so literally. And, you know, it tells us that on the day of judgment, peoples of the world will be standing before Jesus and he'll separate and put some to his right and some to his left. And to those in his right hand, he would say, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. And then they will say, Lord, when did we feed you? When did we give you drink? When did we clothe you? When did we visit you when you were sick or in prison? And he would say, when you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. You did it to me. When you go into that prison and you minister, when you feed a hungry person, when you go and bless someone who's not well, you're meeting Jesus. You're meeting Jesus. I'm having an incredible privilege right now to do Bible studies at a new rehab here in the county. And uh, this is uh, the kind of rehab where many, many, many of the guys have been in and out of jail many times. And I go and I do this Bible study and I realize I'm in the presence of Jesus. It's pretty amazing. So yeah, I really want to encourage this ministry, encourage you in the Hartford County ministry here locally. Uh, it's powerful. Let's see, uh, we want to uh, ask you to pray. We're having our harvest party tonight, so we will have worship as always in here at 6 o'clock, but starting 5.30 to 7.30 over in the youth tent and then outside, our children's ministry and youth ministry are um, uh, providing this harvest party. So this is for families, children pre-K up through 8th uh, grade are welcome to come, and I want to ask you to consider inviting, even this afternoon. Call somebody, invite a family you know with children, because we have seen again and again that children lead their whole family to Jesus. We've seen that over and over again here, and so a powerful way of reaching with the love of Jesus is to invite families, to invite children, invite families to come. It's just a, a whole lot of fun over there. Uh, I, every year, I'm in here preaching, and I'm, I can see out into the door. I'm going to be over there having fun. And <laughs> but it's a, it's a blessed time, and so please uh, lift up our um, just uh, this harvest party in prayer. Amen. All right. Lead us in prayer. Yeah. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for the time to praise your name through song, um, to to come to your table, Lord, for communion. We thank you for the time to, 
to give, to, to bless. We thank you for the opportunities we have here this morning to worship you, Lord. What a privilege we have to live in a nation where we can worship you uh, freely. And so, God, we thank you so much. We um, pray you would just watch over those who are serving um, in our military. We lift them to you right now, Lord. We, we lift this world to you as there's so much um, challenge going on. And Father, we just are praying for peace. We're praying for um, your people in every land to be your hands and feet, to lift up the name of Jesus. And I thank you that we can do that today. We can um, do that all throughout the week, Lord. We can lift up your name in the way we talk, in the way we act, in the way we um, think. The, Lord, help us to be uh, your hands and feet. Just produce in us the fruit of the Spirit. And Lord, we thank you so much for um, opportunities like, like this evening where we can invite people Lord, if there's someone on our hearts, uh, or, or not yet, but you would place them on our hearts who were to call to invite, I pray you would just do that this morning, Lord, and we would be obedient to you. As we go to your word now, Lord, we thank you so much to be in your word, to, to be able to read and understand and uh, be taught by you, Lord. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. As we prepare to go to the Word, um, I do want to lead us in a time praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, God is very clear, and we're going to do that this morning. I also want to uh, um, just talk a little bit about this season that we're in here. So next weekend will be my last weekend with you as the pastor of, of Mount Zion Church. And this morning, I'm going to be sharing with you what we have learned here for the past 36 years. I'm going to put it all in one sermon. What do you think about that? So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we're going to talk about that uh, next weekend. I'm uh, going to be bringing some more things I want to share with you on my last uh, weekend with you. Here's what I want to say. I've been asking you since the month of January to pray about three different things. And that is, first of all, to to pray that the Lord um, be at work in this congregation moving forward. God has been doing such a wonderful thing here for so many years, and I am completely and absolutely confident that he is at work. He who began a good work in us brings it to completion. He knows the end from the beginning. And as I've shared with you many times, he told me very plainly, Craig, do not disobey me. I am telling you to step down now to retire and if you disobey me, you'll be standing in the way of what I want to do here at Mount Zion Church next. And so I am completely and absolutely confident uh, that God is at work here and will continue to be at work and do a greater thing here uh, than we've seen thus far. And so I want to ask you to continue to pray for that. Uh, I want to ask you to pray. We have a nine-member church council. And uh, we have an excellent church council, and they are praying for this congregation nonstop, seeking the Lord's direction. The church council doesn't involve itself in the day-to-day -day ministries, but they set the big, you know, the, the vision for us, and they seek the vision from the Lord and put it in front of us. And so please pray, continue to pray for our church council. As you know, this, denomin this uh, congregation is leaving the denomination that we've been part of uh, since our founding, way back in 1859, and I believe that was a very clear word from the Lord that we've discerned very clearly and carefully. Uh, it came to a congregational vote. 95% of you all agreed in that vote, and I believe the Lord has clearly led us in this direction, that we would stay true to the Word of God and uh, Part of leaving the denomination is a financial obligation and a large financial obligation. And so I am asking you to pray that God would provide a million dollars. And you say, what? Except that that's what we've done here for the past 36 years and all these different building projects that we've done. Uh, we never went into debt for any of them. We just prayed. Uh, if you are online, you got a letter from me this past 
week. If you're not online, well, all of us will be getting, also getting that letter in a hard copy, probably arriving Tuesday or Wednesday. And in there, I include all these prayer requests and also particularly about the money. And here's the thing about the money. With the building projects, we never set a deadline, right? We just determined we would build when the funds came in. And we just put the need out, we prayed, and God provided each and every time. In this, we have a deadline imposed on us. And so we have to give that money uh, by October 31st. So obviously a week and a half away, and, or we would not be able to leave uh, this denomination. So our church council has secured a loan, and um, I'll tell you, uh, I have lots and lots of stories about that, but what I want to tell you is that uh, even the repaying of that loan, if we had to just repay it straight out, if we weren't praying for God to provide this huge gift, that huge gift never came in, even repaying that, we'd be paying much less, considerably less each month in repaying that loan than we currently send to the denomination, to be part of this denomination. So uh, the church council does not believe they're putting us in a very bad place. I do not believe we are violating what we determined was the Lord's will for us years ago of not going into debt because this deadline has been imposed on us. But what I am asking is that you would pray earnestly that God would provide that $1 million. And we've seen him do this miraculously again and again. And if you will uh, keep that uh, in your prayers, I know God will do that. And the last thing I want, I've been asking you to pray is that God would raise up the next pastor. And he, uh, you know, when he spoke to Jeremiah, he said, look, before you were born, before I knit you together in your mother's womb, I knew my plans for you. I called you to be this prophet, in that case, to the people of Israel. We know God has already chosen. We know that he established his plans for all of us before he did anything else. The plans for your life were established before God put the stars in the sky. He's not just a big God. He's an infinite God. So we know that God has exactly the person that he's calling to be the next pastor of this congregation. And so I want to ask you to continue to pray that God would raise up that person. I thought for sure as we started down this process way back in the month of January that uh, we needed to have that person in place uh, by the time I am no longer the pastor here. Now I've learned through a whole number of uh, persons, a member of this congregation, who was the, the head of a church council in another congregation, and they had a pastor who had been there 37 years. I've been here 36. They had their next pastor lined up to begin the next Sunday. It did not go well. Other, two other members of this congregation have been on staffs of churches about this size or larger. They went through the same season, and uh, long-term pastors retired. They didn't have the next pastor uh, found yet, and they went through a season where the staff took on the duties of the pastor, and they said it was the best thing that could have ever happened to them. And their churches uh, continued to thrive and grew and grew during that season. It seems counterintuitive to us. We don't have a pastor. How's the church going to do well? But these brothers both told me their churches thrived during that time, and they said it was the best thing that could have happened. So I am believing strongly that God is leading this congregation now into a season where the members of the staff are going to take on the different uh, responsibilities and tasks of the pastor, and I believe that God will work powerfully in and through all this. So in terms of the preaching, you're going to have different staff members here and other persons from the congregation, uh, a different person preaching each, each week. And what both of these brothers told me uh, about their churches that they were part of is that the congregation just grew tighter and tighter with one another and the ministries thrived more and more. So I want to encourage you to lift up our staff in, in prayer. Uh, so next weekend, I'll be preaching at all the worship gatherings through the weekend. At the 11 a.m. service, we're going to have the, as many members of the staff are able to be here. Some of them can't be here because of their responsibilities on Sunday morning in the other building or but as many can be here at 11 a.m., and then our church council as well, and we're all going to pray for them as we move into this new season. So before we go to the Word, uh, I'd like to just lift all this up in prayer right now.
So, Lord God, we, we are very grateful and thankful. We're so grateful, Lord, that you have been so good to us. And, uh, Lord, we just lift our hearts up to you. We pray, Father, for uh, this, this congregation, this work that you have been doing here in this place since 1859, Lord God. And we thank you that you've promised if we ask, we will receive. If we seek, we will find. If we knock, the door will be open to us. And so, Lord God, we're bringing these requests before you. We're asking, Lord, that you would continue to be at work here in this place and in a greater way. We're asking that you would bring that right person to be the next pastor, shepherd of this congregation. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You are the good shepherd. You are the shepherd of us all. So we're asking, Father, you'd bring that right pastor here. We're asking that you would be with the staff of this congregation, that you would be with the church council here. Lord God, that you would do a great work of leadership here in this place. We're asking, Lord, that you would provide these funds. We're asking, Lord, it seems so uh, almost unreal to us to ask you to provide $1 million, Lord, but that's what we're asking for, Lord God, and we know that as you tell us, the cattle on a thousand hills is yours. Lord, you are our provider. You open the windows of heaven and pour out uh, provision, Lord, to your people. And so this is what we're asking for. Lord God, we are praying today for the peace of Jerusalem. We know we are a branch grafted on to the tree of Israel, Lord God, and we are praying, Lord God, for peace. We're praying, Lord God, that you would bless and pour out your goodness upon your people, Lord God, upon that land. We come to you, Father, and we thank you that you are faithful. You're faithful to your word. So we lift our hearts before you. We ask that you would speak to us as we go to your word now. We pray all these things, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. All right, 36 years. What have we learned in 36 years in one sermon right here, right now? All right, so some years ago, I uh, was trying to think of a way to describe what's going on here at Mount Zion Church. And those three phrases, you see them written in our bulletin every week. You hear me say them so often that we are pouring out our hearts in prayer. We're getting strong in the word of God. And we are putting our faith in Jesus into action. And it, it, it just kind of came to me. The, this is what we have learned here at Mount Zion. This is who we have become. It's what we've learned. It's, it's what I'm asking you to pray that this congregation always be and that each one of us always be people who are pouring out our hearts in prayer, getting strong in the word of God, putting our faith in Jesus into action. And what I want to do is to go into the word and look at these three things that we have learned. Since I put that sermon title out on social media and on the newsletter, I've gotten several messages saying, well, here's what I've learned, and people have told me different things, how God spoke to them powerfully here in this congregation at different times, and, and of course, he speaks to all of us always. It, it amazes me, uh, sometimes I'll be shaking people's hands after worship, and somebody will come up, and they'll say, thank you so much for saying, and then they'll tell me something, how God, as their sermon was being preached, how God was speaking to their hearts so powerfully, and I'm standing there thinking, those words didn't come out of my mouth. I didn't say those words. And uh, because God was speaking to that person's heart. And so he's spoken to us all. But I want to look at these three things as one way of looking at what God has spoken to us here all through these years. So let's, uh, let's begin here and go to the book of Acts here. And so thinking about prayer. Here's something I believe that I know I've learned and I believe all of us have learned, and that is that nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible when God's people together humbly pour out their hearts. When we together humbly pour out our hearts to him, nothing is impossible. Absolutely nothing. Jesus said it over and over again. Nothing's impossible. To those who believe, all things are possible with God when we are humbly together pouring out our hearts to him. So what's going on here, this is now after Jesus is back with the Father and the followers of Jesus there in Jerusalem, persecution breaks out against them. The king, King Herod, who was a maniac, insanely 
paranoid, suspicious at all times. He's sensing that it's politically expedient for him to launch persecution on the church. One of the disciples, James, was, was martyred, and then Peter is arrested. So he's dragged off to uh, King Herod's prison. It says, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer, not just formal liturgical prayers, nice little prayers, earnest prayer. You know, the scripture does say, pour out your heart before him. I'm so glad when I learned that prayer is just pouring out your heart. Not try, I, for so long, I was trying to just do it right, just to get it exactly right how I'm supposed to pray. And the Hebrew word for prayer is, there's a whole number of different, the Hebrew is a picture language, a bunch of different pictures in that word, but the main word is pouring out, like pouring out a pitcher of water. Just pour out. So the church, the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem, were pouring out their hearts for Peter. Now, they knew this was an impossible prayer request. King Herod doesn't release people. He kills people. They knew that. There was no possible way that Peter could escape. There was no possible way that Herod would have a a change of heart. They knew that, but they had learned from Jesus that nothing is impossible with God. So they're pouring out, pouring out their hearts. Maybe you are in some impossible situation. You are in some kind of prison the way Peter was in prison. There's something, there's some chains on you. And here's God saying, pour out your heart. Get some other people and humbly pour out your heart before me. Nothing is impossible with me. And so at verse 6, it says, Now when Herod was about to bring him out, bring him out of the prison, meaning almost certainly, and put him to death, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. They were making sure nobody's going to break into this prison and get him out of there. Between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. This was an impossible situation. Peter is as close to being a dead man. But at verse 7, it says, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. What were the people of God doing? They were praying, and they were praying. Could they have imagined that an angel would show up, that a bright light would shine in the cell, that the chains would fall off his hands? They couldn't have even imagined that, but they were pouring out their hearts. Nothing is impossible when we pour out our hearts and we pour out our hearts to God. You know, I think back through the years here at Mount Zion, some of the things that just seemed impossible. Start an orphanage on the other side of the world? Where are we going to get the millions of dollars it's going to take over the years to operate an orphanage? That's impossible. When our Beyond Capernaum ministry, the special needs ministry, was, you know, 12, 15, 20 people, and then we realized it's, it's going like this, it's going like this, and we realized we need to invest a whole lot of money. We need to hire somebody full-time to lead this thing, and if we do, God will just do a huge thing. But the budget was in no shape for that. That's impossible. But God does the impossible when his people pray. You know, one of the great privileges of being a pastor is I get to pray with person after person after person after person after person and to see what God does in the life of a congregation when a congregation is a people who pray. I'm so grateful for a pastor who came here in 1964, Owen Womack, who taught this congregation how to pray. He came preaching the gospel and a whole bunch of people left. The whole bunch of people, I think, were just kind of doing church and he came preaching the gospel. A lot of people left, but the ones who stayed came to Jesus. They put their heart, their, their faith in Jesus and they poured out their hearts. Owen taught them how to pray. When I arrived here at Mount Zion, 36 years ago, uh, that was the reputation of this church. It's a praying church. Uh, Our dear brother, Randy Markoff, he's told us many times, he and Betty were at another church, and they were talking about prayer, and they said, well, if you want to go to a church that prays, go to Mount Zion. (laughs) They said, why don't you all go to that church over there? We don't don't do that here. So, uh, wow. So, people of God are praying. The chains fell off. Look at verse 8. It says, and the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Come on, let's go. We're moving. We're moving forward. Let's go. 
I believe that's what the Lord's saying to Mount Zion right now. We're moving forward. Let's go. The man who led me to Jesus the summer after my 10th grade year, how he meant so much to me, so much to me. He led me to Jesus. I had grown up in church my whole life, but I can't remember a single word preacher ever said. And then here, this man came, and I started to go to this youth group, and I gave my heart to Jesus. A year after I gave my heart to Jesus, he said he's moving to California, this, this youth leader. I was crushed. I was crushed in our whole youth group. It was a dynamic group. We were all crushed. Wow. But God had plans. He had plans. And that youth leader said, you all just pray. You all just pray. You all just pray. I had my eyes too much on him, right? We had this whole youth group. We had our eyes on that guy. And that guy just told us, pray. And God did an awesome thing. That group just expanded and grew and did Amazing things. So the angel says, all right, let's get ready. Let's go. So at verse 9 then. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. This is like a dream. This is like can't be happening. I must be just like sleeping and dreaming, seeing a vision or something. He couldn't believe it was really happening. But it was happening. It was happening. God's people. Peter... I, I guess he would have known. He would have at least hoped they were all praying for him, but they were earnestly praying, pouring out their hearts. And Peter's just like living a dream now. He's thinking he's, he's just dreaming, seeing a vision. At verse 10 then, when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. They went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. When you see uh, some loved one of yours in an impossible situation, pour out your heart. Pour out your heart. Nothing is impossible when God's people pray. Now, let's look in the, the Gospel of Matthew here, something Jesus says about praying. He says, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Any moment, any day, we are to pray, to pour out our hearts. The Apostle Paul said, pray without ceasing, right? But here Jesus said, when you come together to pray, all the more, nothing is impossible. If two of you, just two of you agree on earth, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So the question is, do you have people you're praying with? Do you, that's why we hear in our congregation, as I've been saying, uh, kind of laughing now since the month of January, I, I, when I told you all, the Lord made it claim to me I'm to retire. This congregation has been just growing and growing and growing in size. I'm like, really, God, you're messing with me. But uh, I believe it's God saying, no, I told you. It's a congregation, well, a congregation of this size, it's very hard, right? Because there's a lot of people. We're 700, 750, uh, sometimes 800 people on a weekend here now. It's very hard to find that unless you press in. And I would encourage you, if you're not a part of one of our, what we call connecting groups, join one, start one. Andy, who was up here earlier, that's his whole task, to help people get connected. Find persons to pray with. Because when we agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven at verse 20. He goes on, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. He is here. He's here as we pray in worship. He's here when you gather with two, three, four, five, whatever it is, number of people in a group. Get connected. Pray together, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, Jesus said something else about prayer. Let's look in the gospel of Luke here. And what's he's telling us here? He's telling us that prayer that is not humble prayer is no prayer at all. So he also told this parable, this story, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So he's telling this his story to some persons who were prideful, arrogant, who looked to themselves and said, what a good guy I am. I'm so holy. I'm so righteous. I'm so smart. And treated others with contempt, judged and judged and judged those all around him. So Jesus told a story at verse 10. You know this story. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, that was a religious leader, and the other a tax collector. They were traitors to their own people. They're despised. They were hated by anyone. The temple wasn't just times of all corporate worship. You could go in any time, and you could pray. So these two men go at the same time to pray. There's undoubtedly other people around praying as well. 
at verse 11. Jesus said, here's how the Pharisee prayed, standing by himself. He prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Everybody prayed out loud. Other people are around. This Pharisee's putting on a show for everybody, right? He's filled with pride. He's filled with pride. He has contempt for others. I have a feeling Jesus would disagree when he says, I'm so glad I'm not like adulterers. Because Jesus said to the men, he said, if you even look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her. Why are you judging other people? You've already done all these things. But here's this man. He's filled with pride. His prayer is going nowhere. There's nothing impossible that's going to happen in this man's prayer. So at verse 12, the Pharisee goes on, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. God, look at me. He's really talking to all the people who are also there in the temple. Look at me, look how good, how holy I am. At verse 13, Jesus said, the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Here's a humble man. Prayer that is not humble is not prayer. It's not pouring out your heart before the Lord. What a broken and contrite spirit he does not despise. Right? What does Apostle Paul say? There's nothing good in us. There's nothing good in us. If I start to begin to think there's something good in me, then I'm, I'm fooling myself. There's nothing good in us. It's the Lord and the Lord alone who is good. Right? So this, this tax collector knows there's nothing good in him, and he's asking God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So at verse 14, Jesus concludes, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, that means right with God, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Everyone who says me, 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 will be cast down. But the one who humbles himself will be lifted up, exalted. So we've learned this. I was, Lisa and I were so grateful when we first came to Mount Zion Church and realized this was a humble congregation. A humble congregation. We were so incredibly blessed. I think that and we saw the boxes of tissues at the altar up in the old building there and we knew it was a praying church and it was a humble church and we were so, so grateful to come here. We've learned this. Nothing is impossible. If something seems impossible, get some other people, pray together, stay humble before the Lord, pour out your heart. All right, so there's a second thing. Now, thinking about the word of God. Uh, we say we're pouring out our hearts in prayer. We're getting strong in the word. So here's what we've learned. That amazing strength comes to those who go and go and go and go to the word of God, getting taught by the Holy Spirit. When we go and go and go to the word of God, when we allow the Holy Spirit, when we call on the Holy Spirit within us, you know, when you put your faith in Jesus, not only does forgiveness and mercy come from the Lord, the Father pours out the Holy Spirit. He comes to dwell within us. And what we've learned here is that if you go and go and go to the word of God, the Holy Spirit will teach you and you will have amazing strength. And so look at Proverbs 30 at verse 5. This is a verse I've held on to for so many years. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Every word of God proves true. So when you read in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word proves true. If I will believe, if I will go and go and believe that his word proves true, it is true. Every word of God proves true. There's amazing strength that comes. I've met with so many people who are just overwhelmed with their shame, overwhelmed, uh, broken with their, their failings. And here's this amazing promise. The question is, do I believe it's true? Do I believe it's true? If I will take God at his word, if I will believe his word, he will be a shield. He will be a refuge. He will be that fortress, that strong place. Amazing strength comes to those who believe the word of God. And so we are holding on to the word of God. We're, we're, you know, I'm so glad. You know, I went to, um, 
after, while I was in college, I knew the Lord was calling me to, to become a pastor, and I went off to seminary, fancy schmancy seminary, and uh, after a while, we started to call it cemetery instead of seminary, and, um, <laughs> and it took me a few years to get over cemetery, uh, I mean seminary, uh, served at a church down in Baltimore, I arrived here uh, five years later. Now, I fell in love with Jesus, I fell in love with his word when I was 15, and I gave my heart to Jesus, but when I came to this congregation, and saw the depth of love for Jesus, and saw the depth of love for God's word. Wow, wow. Up in that old sanctuary, I fell deeply in love with Jesus, deeply in love with the word of God. And amazing strength comes when you go and go and go to the word of God. I was always such a reader, and I, I considered myself maybe like a renaissance man, and I'm reading a little bit of this, and a little bit of that, and a little bit of this, and a little bit of that, philosophy, everything. I'm reading all kinds of stuff. All of that just fell away as I fell in love with the word of God because there is so much power in one sentence, more power in one sentence of the word of God than in all the rest of these books put together. Wow. Go and go and go to the word of God. Go. Believing, trusting, knowing that every word of God proves true. Mount Zion will be, continue to be blessed as Mount Zion continues to pour out its heart in prayer, continues to go and go and go and believe the word of God. Wow. Now, let's go to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew again. So, uh, here's Jesus. He says, look, everyone then who hears these words of mine, you remember as he preached these last, what, nine weeks, eight, nine weeks, we looked at what is often called the Sermon on the Mount. He had this huge crowd of people around him on this kind of sloping mountain, and, uh, and he preached. And at the end of that long message, he says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Who hears these words of mine and does them. Do we put it into practice? Do we put, you've heard me say so many times, Joseph Stalin had the entire New Testament memorized as a boy. He obviously didn't put it into practice right? Led the worst massacre in history of 20 million Ukrainians, right? But the person who hears these words of mine and does them, puts them into practice, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So at verse 25, it says, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Sometimes we take the Bible and we make it all about knowledge, 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 knowledge in my head, and we don't put it into practice. Every word of God proves true. Every word is to put into practice. We're not to selectively choose what we want to put into practice, but we're to put all of it into practice. And the more that we go and go and go and put into practice, do what the word tells us, we are building our house on the rock so when the storms come, as they're obviously coming on this world right now, as the storms are obviously coming on this world right now, when the storms come, if I've gone and gone and gone to the word of God and put it into practice, Right? The, the, the house will not fall. Your life will not fall because it's been founded on the rock. So when this vision to establish an orphanage came, well, the book of James says, uh, religion that's pure and undefiled before God is to visit widows and orphans in their affliction and to stay unstained from the world, remain unstained from the world. Were we going to put that in practice or not? This is impossible. We don't have all this money. But you know, God said, give and I will bless. That's what my pastor, when I, the day I was ordained all those years ago, my home church pastor said, don't ever worry about money, just pray and give to the poor. That's what the Bible says to do. As Mount Zion does that, continues to just pray and give to the poor and live according to the word of God in everything the word of God says. The storms will come, but the house does not fall. At verse 26, says, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. You can build a beautiful house on the stand, sand, but when the storms come, at verse 27, obviously the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You know, what's going on in church in America is that the word is disappearing more and more and more and more. Even churches that I know that, of, that 20 years ago were preaching the word, the word is now less and less and less and less. There's a, what I call a TED Talk vibe going on in church life in America. And God says, no, you go and go and go and go to the word of God. 
Go to the Word of God. Go to the Word of God. You know, when I was in seminary, they taught us when you preach, have all these kind of illustrations and, and, you know, stories of all kinds of illustrations. So, yeah, illustrations. But what? The best illustrations are in the Bible itself. (laughs) Those are the illustrations. Those are the stories to grab hold of. So as we go and go to the Word of God and believe it's true and put it into practice, we stand, our lives stand strongly as we go to the Word of God. Now, look here in, uh, our, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, or John. So, here's uh, Jesus. He's, he's with his disciples at that Last Supper, and he says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Remember, after he ascends then to the Father, the Father sends the Holy Spirit first to the, to the, for the first time to the followers of Jesus. He says, Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You know, in the Gospel of John in in chapter 12, it says, how can we know the things of God uh, unless the Holy Spirit teaches us? So we can read and read. You know, before I gave my heart to Jesus, before I prayed that simple prayer and I was 15, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Uh, Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. I would try to read the Bible sometime. I could never make out one thing it said. I just couldn't understand any of it. And then I prayed this simple prayer and everything changed. Because when you ask the Holy Spirit to come in, he does. And he teaches us. So he will teach you all things. So as you go to the word of God, ask the spirit of God to teach you. If you've not put your faith in Jesus, if you've not asked the Holy Spirit to come, ask him to come and fill your heart. And he will teach you all things. As you go to his word, he will teach you the truths of his word. And then this, and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And bring to your remembrance... You can't remember something that you haven't heard or read. So go and go and go to the Word of God. And when you need it, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance. So when I was a brand new pastor here, and uh, a, a woman comes, I, I knew her here, and she brought her husband, and she'd been telling me he's, he's like a, a Satan worshiper, and he's all kinds of stuff. And he, she comes and knocks on the door one day. We used to live up there where the office is now. And she says, my husband's out in the car. And I walked out in the parking lot, and he fell out of the car. And onto the parking lot. And then he's making, running big circles around the parking lot, making all kinds of crazy animal sounds. And I have this brand new pastor. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And the Holy Spirit brought to my remembrance exactly what Jesus did when the crazy man came running out of the cemetery, screaming, what did Jesus say? What is your name? So the next time this guy ran around, I said, what's your name? <laughs> he fell right on the parking lot. <laughs> he didn't give his heart to Jesus that day, but just two months later, he gave his heart to Jesus, was baptized, had followed Jesus the rest of his life. So he brings, he brings to our remembrance what we need. Another time I went to visit somebody, member of the church here, and I didn't realize it was a setup. The man's, the husband's wife didn't realize it was a setup. I came in, sat down in the living room, and he starts just blasting me and blasting me. I can't even remember what he was angry about. And he's just getting louder and louder and louder and louder. And what the Holy Spirit brought to my remembrance, a soft answer turns away wrath. So the louder he got, the quieter I got. It all turned around. Whatever the problem was, it got all sorted out. We had a good visit. If you go and go and go to his word, the Holy Spirit will not only teach you, but bring to your remembrance what you need when you need it. So as Mount Zion Church continues to pour out our hearts in prayer, you know, I keep saying our hearts. Lisa and I won't be worshiping with you here, but we will be praying for you every day. You are our family. You are our family. Our hearts. So as we continue to pour out our hearts in prayer, as we continue to go and go and go to the word of God, God will do amazing things. Amazing strength comes. Nothing is impossible. So there's one more thing. Now, thinking about what are we doing? We are putting our faith in Jesus into action. So here's the thing that we've learned. If we don't do the works of love, our faith in Jesus dies. If we don't do the works of love, our faith in Jesus dies dies. So what are you talking about, Pastor Craig? Let's look at the book of James. Uh, You know this. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Now, when I was 15 and I was in that moment and I prayed, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. Did I have the works of love going on in my heart? No. I had that mustard seed sized faith in that moment, right at that moment. But if that mustard seed-sized faith 
stayed that mustard seed size faith, and I didn't, as the scripture says, work out my salvation with fear and trembling, I didn't then proceed to do the works of love, what would have happened to that faith? It would have died. Why? Look at verse 15 here. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and in lacking in daily food. So we have a brother or sister, uh, someone who's in great need at verse 16. And then one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What is good is that? It's words, it's nothing else. And so at verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It dies. And so the Lord has taught us here to do the works, to do the works, to do the works of love so that our faith in Jesus doesn't die. So it doesn't die. And you say, Pastor Craig, I'm remembering in the book of Ephesians, it sounds like something different, like something opposite. So let's look in the book of Ephesians here. Chapter two, you know these words. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Grace, that undeserved, unearned love, favor of God. That's what God's grace came to me when I was 15. I didn't earn this. I didn't deserve it. None of us deserved that Jesus went to that cross and died for us. How did I receive it? I received it by faith. In essence, I lifted up my hands to receive this gift of forgiveness and mercy and salvation by faith. All I did was, I said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive my sin, and I believe that he did it. And that's by faith. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It was a gift to me. All I did was lift up my hands by faith to receive it. And then at verse nine, so you say, well, wait, Pastor Craig, you said without works, it dies. Yes, exactly. Look at verse nine. He says, not a result of works so that no one may boast. There was no works being done by me that day. It was in a hotel lobby, some little hotel in the back street of Ocean City, New Jersey, late at night. There was no works being done by me in that moment. It was faith saying, Lord Jesus, please, I believe you died for me on that cross. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. But then at verse 10, here's what I'm talking about. For we are his workmanship. When he pours out his Holy Spirit, when he comes in, he begins to do a work. He begins to create in us the kindness and the compassion and the love and the strength and the mercy, right, that to equip us, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He comes to us not only to save us for that day of eternity, right, but to create us to be people who do the good works of love, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is what we've learned here at Mount Zion, to walk in the good works of love that God has called us to do. And if we don't do that, we die. Our faith dies. You know, Jesus said things like that all the time. He said, well, look, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. What? Because if I will not forgive, right, then I'm not doing the work of love, then my faith is going to die. I won't receive forgiveness and mercy on that day. He said, look, I I will say, when he said to those on the right hand, you you fed me when I was hungry, you you clothed me, you visited me, he'll say to those on the left hand, I was hungry, you didn't give me anything to eat, I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink, I was was naked, you didn't give me clothes, I was sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. And they'll say, when didn't we do it? And he'll say, when you didn't do it to one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me, depart from me into the outer darkness. I'm not gonna let you live and hurt my people for eternity. Depart from me. You're not going to inherit my kingdom. And so if we don't do these works of love, then our faith dies. And I'm so grateful for this congregation that we have learned how to love, to put our faith in Jesus into action, doing the good works of love that God is equipping us to do, equipping us to do. He equips us to do these good works of love by loving us with such an amazing love. How could I not forgive when he has forgiven me of so much? How could I not be patient when he's been so patient with me? How could I not open my hand and give to those in need when he's always given to me? That's how he equips us. And so then our choice is whether to go and do those good works of love or not. One last scripture in 1 John. It says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does what is best, whoever does the works of love. He says, you want to see the evidence? You know, Jesus said, look, it's not by their words. You'll know them by their fruit. He said, there's a whole lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. 
You'll know them by their fruit. That's how you'll know them. We know ourselves. We can fool ourselves with our words and our thinking in our head. Right? Am I doing the works of love? Am I doing what's best for those around me? Am I loving my enemy even, as Jesus said? Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So at verse 8 then, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And so here's this amazing truth that our Lord has taught us to do the works of love, to keep our faith alive by doing the works of love. Yes, we must go and go and go to the word of God. We must pour out our hearts in prayer. And we do all three of these. And God does amazing things. He's a great God, amen? He is a great God. Let's give thanks to our God and to our Lord. Lord God, we're so grateful. We're so grateful, Lord. We just love you and we thank you. And we, we just lift our hearts before you, Father. We commit our lives to you. We commit this congregation to you. We thank you, Lord. You've taught us how to pour out our hearts before you humbly together, Lord God, that nothing's impossible. You've taught us, Lord, to go and go to your word, to believe that every word of yours proves true, Lord God, that you will bring it back to us. You'll teach us when we need it. And you've taught us to do the works of love to put our faith in Jesus into action. And so we love you, Father. We thank you. We just lift our hearts before you here. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Pastor Craig's been preaching longer and longer the closer he gets to retiring. And uh, <laughs> only one more week, I promise. And uh, <laughs> hey, I'm hoping you might come up here and pray for Mount Zion right now as we sing this last song. Maybe you're praying for yourself. You're praying for somebody, but come. Let's stand. Let's pray. Sing our praise to our God. Seek a 
crown For my reward is giving glory to you I want to take your word And shine it all around First help me just to live it on And when I'm doing well Help me to never seek a crown For my reward is giving glory Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Amen.